Hello and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Caitlin Dormer. Today our guest is Buena Vista City Manager Jay Scudder. Mr. Scudder is a native of Bedford County and a graduate of James Madison University. Almost 24 years ago, he quit a job in the business world to pursue a career in Virginia local government. He served as the county administrator for Patrick and Fluvanna counties, but it was his background in finance that really set him apart. Between the Vista Links golf course debt and the school budget problems, the city was bleeding money by the time Mr. Scudder came into office in December of 2011. Almost one year later, we're here to find out how his agenda is affecting the city. Welcome, Mr. Scudder. Welcome. Glad to be here, Caitlin. Well, I want to begin by talking about change. Unfortunately for Buena Vista, a lot of the city's financial troubles have kind of been documented all the way up to the Wall Street Journal. They have. What has changed since you've come aboard? Well, I think what's changed since I came aboard is we've done a lot of community education on the financial situation that we're in. And the City Council of Buena Vista has really approached it from a realistic sense. So I think living in reality, really looking at the circumstances we're in and what we have to deal with head on. Um, and really, again, I can't underemphasize community education because even though we had a very difficult budget process and the realization of our fiscal problems, pretty much that reality was embraced by the community. And I think our openness and realistic approach towards the financial situation is the difference in what was going on before. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the financial issues. You held a retreat with the members of the Buena Vista City Council yes. shortly after you came into office in February. Yes. Um, the News Gazette said that you talked about many options to kind of fix the city's fiscal problems. Right. You talked about potentially closing a school, um, shutting down the golf course, and becoming a city of the second class, which I understand was a brief conversation. Mm -hmm. um, will you recap the retreat for us and sure. what, what did it do and how did it make you more clear? Okay. Well, the first thing I want to clarify is those things on the table were not my ideas. Those are things that have been discussed for, for years. Um, consolidation of a schools, reverting to a town and all those kind of things. I think the, the thing that we focused on the most during that retreat was kind of breaking down the city and the school budget and looking at how the funds are allocated. And then I think the second approach to that was, again, talking about the financial reality and what we were looking at from a budget standpoint. And, and the third thing was, since we're in this situation, how can we fiscally plan better and how can we budget more accurately so not only the public but the city council that the, the decision makers have a better means of really judging where they are and so b accurate budgeting and being realistic was something that we really had to focus on and I think that we were fortunate in the fact that we embraced that and really stepped up to the plate you know we raised the tax rate about 14 cents um, and I think the breakdown of where the money is going and what has to be done is what I, I think that's what the whole retreat was about. It was really about focusing on where we were and how could we deal with it within the limited parameters that we have. You mentioned raising the tax rate. How did the public respond? How is the public responding? Well, I, I think the, the public responded very well. I think the public, um, through you know the information gathering that we did and the you know, really the uh, community networking that we provided, open government, you know, I'm very open, people can come in my office and talk about it. You know, certainly you had people that were questioning why we needed to raise taxes or how can we raise taxes at this kind of time when everybody's having difficult times. But I think the, the thing that made the difference for me was that the community, and when I say that, city council as well and myself, we all embraced it that you know that this is a community thing and we've all got to deal with it collectively and uh, and openly so that it made a difference approaching it from from that standpoint but uh it you're, you're correct caitlin it was a very involved retreat and it was tough it's tough to look at some of the fiscal challenges like the golf course um let's talk about the golf course then 
Um, a lot of people think that this is that this has been the albatross of the city's financial struggles. Mm -hmm. um, so why do the city hang on to it? Why does the city continue to hang on to it if it continues to cost Buena Vista money? Well, that's an extremely complicated uh, process to go through. The city went through that process with folks on Wall Street, with folks in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and decided that the thing that's better for the community in the long run is to embrace the debt embrace the golf course and move forward. So we kind of coined the phrase at that time, uh, or at least I did, and it, some of that was in the media, was that we're a city in motion. You know, uh, cities uh, reach different points of time because of decisions that have been made, um, and you have to look forward. And, and even w while you're looking forward, you have to look back. And one of the things I pointed out to the community was that remember when the flood wall was built? It was a very political, controversial issue and a very financial issue. But now, today, 25 years later, we look back at this decision and it's an asset for the community. So who knows what the golf course is gonna be as an asset and what it's gonna bring if we're looking at our situation 20, 30 years down the road. So we're a city in motion and we approached it from that standpoint. So perhaps you feel that the golf course plan was in its infancy a good idea for the community, that it could bring people to Buena Vista, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm, I'm always very careful when we're, you know, you can't really throw stones at past decisions. Decision makers make those decisions based on the information that they have. So to go back and look at that from a hindsight is, you know, hindsight's 2020. I, I understand what the vision was to lift up Buena Vista and try to create a higher quality of life and hopefully a higher standard of living. That has a lot of different factors involved, socioeconomic change. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at the data at the time and the things were discussed, you know, it, it was a, a risky uh, investment. Um, and, but the timing for the development arena, <clears throat> excuse me, golf courses, uh, that type of neo-traditional development around them was kind of the wave at the time. And Buena Vista made the decision based on that, that, that time. So it has put us in a tough situation. Okay, so let's talk about um, some other ways that you've managed the city's money. Earlier this year we talked about Hall Spring and how it was the plan to put Hall Spring back on the line with Dickinson Well. Right. And you decided to take that in a different direction. Now, what exactly did you suggest to city council? Why not put Hall Spring back on the well? Okay, well, you had some of these decisions uh, were made, the, the direction of the decisions were made at a time of crisis. Uh, there was a lot going on. There were fiscal issues, like you mentioned, of the golf course going on. There was the Dickinson Well being closed and which drastically impacted the availability of water supply for Buena Vista. So uh, some of the dust hadn't settled in the decision making and there were two decisions that involved water. There was the extraction from the Mare River to water the golf course and then there was bringing Hall Spring online. And if we're looking at it today, we've got ample water supply. All we have to do is go through about another year. So we didn't really need to spend $150,000, $200,000 to water the golf course because the things that were broke at the time are working. Hall Spring, when Dickinson Well comes online, the city's going to have over double the water supply that it had, that it has today, over double. And really, it, it, so just the Dickinson Well provides a lot of water. Hall Spring puts out uh, about 225, 275 gallons of water, I think, per minute. I might be wrong. But in order to bring Hall Spring online, it was going to be a cost of about 400000 to half a million dollars, based on the engineer's estimates. And for the amount of water, when we've already got ample water supply, when Dickinson Well comes on a year later, really the, the, the cost-benefit analysis didn't go with investing a million dollars in bringing more water. And my daughter asked me that question who's your age, goes to JMU. 
and about, well, why not get more water? And I kind of explained it. I said, well, if you've got a full glass and you keep on pouring water in it, where does it go? And when you've got old infrastructure, like we have in Buena Vista, we had a leak that we fixed uh, in the last two weeks. It was actually three, three leaks. Those leaks were, I think they told me they were, we were uh, losing about 100,000 gallons a day. Hmm. So, Mr. Scudder, and I, and I hate to stop you, but yeah. we're actually almost out of time. Um, well, I want to thank you again for joining us here. Thank you. And, uh, you've been watching Newsmakers with special guest Jay Scudder. For the Rockbridge Report, I'm Caitlin Dormer.